Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today, we're going to hear about compulsory heterosexuality by Adrian Rich, being discussed by Angela Wilde, Julia Beck, and Anne Ehrlich. Um, so thanks very much and over to you. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Joe. Yes, this is the Valentine's Day edition of <laughs> Radical Feminist Perspectives. Yes, this is Julia. I'm joined with my good friends, Angela and Anna, and we would love to share with you some of the theory and ideas that Adrienne Rich um, came up with in her essay called Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence. So um, Adrienne Rich was a feminist poet. She was born in 1926. And uh, she said in an attempt to disconnect from her family and also because she thought this means a full life of a woman, she married a man and had three sons in five years. Uh, later, she said motherhood actually radicalized her. She later left her husband and in 1976 started her lifelong lesbian relationship. She said about it that, I quote, the suppressed lesbian I had been carrying in me since adolescence began to stretch her limbs. She wrote her text in 1980 and she died at the age of 82 in 2012. Over to you, Angela. Thank you. So I wanted to say that we all came uh, from to this text from very different life experience and different uh, uh, lesbian journeys as well. And the three of us found the text uh, both very interesting, powerful, and at time quite challenging, but it spoke to us in many different ways and sparks a lot of really interesting conversation. So I do hope that women read it. So I'm going to be introducing uh, the text uh, and to introduce it, I think it's um, uh, first to, to say that it's uh, considered a classic of the lesbian feminist literature and theory. It was written and published as a pamphlet in 1980. And this is what it looks like in the first edition. It's also part uh, of the anthology Bled, Blood, Bread and Poetry, Selected Prose 1979, 1985, if you're looking for it, but it's available online. Um, so to introduce this text, I thought it was important to start by laying some feminist principles that underpin the work, uh, because in today's political context, some of these principles are a bit lost, um, and I thought it was important to bring them back to our memories. So one of the principles to start with is the idea that the personal is political, that what happens in a woman's private life is political in nature. And in the second wave, the practice of consciousness raising helped women understand the systematic nature of our oppression, including in those areas which, which were not traditionally considered political, that means our private and our intimate lives. Um, so the feminists of the 70s and 80s were actively working to understand the nature of women's oppression in order to liberate ourselves from it. And theory, I know it's kind of falling a bit out of fashion, but actually was very, and still is very important to unpack what is happening to women, how we are kept oppressed, but also how to figure out what strategies best to use in order to liberate ourselves. Um, so the radical and lesbian feminist of the time came to the conclusion that everything need to be brought under the feminist attention, everything, including sexuality. So heterosexuality as an oppression was often discussed and is uh, it's quite common, of, in fact, to find uh, text of the time to use that framework, especially when they're discussing sexual violence, rape or pornography. So compulsory heterosexuality and the lesbian existence, the text we're talking about today, is not the first text to discuss heterosexuality as a patriarchal oppression. We heard Sheila Jeffries and Anna Pratt on this platform a couple of weeks ago discussing these. Um, for, for reference, the radical lesbians wrote the woman identified woman back in 1970, uh, Sonia Johnson in 1973. So we are we have we are very lucky that we have a very rich history of written work to explore if you're interested in this topic. Please dive in it. Um, so the text we are talking about, it's, I think, mainly written for feminists in heterosexuality in order to prompt them to question the nature of their sexual orientation. Um, but it also brings the idea that the understanding of heterosexuality politically will be beneficial to all women, whether they are lesbians or whether they are straight. So I'm going to, we're going to go into the first slide and get into the text. Is it sharing? Yes, brilliant. Um, so the first quote uh, is 
the destruction of records and memorabilia and letters documenting the realities of lesbian existence must be taken very seriously as a means of keeping heterosexuality compulsory for women. And so uh, what she means by this is she introduced the concept that we now know of as lesbian erasure, which is the cultural silence around lesbians. And she explains here how very often a book is revealing by what it doesn't talk about, which is namely the invisible lesbians. And this aspect of lesbian erasure is political because it is a strategy. It represents a view, that, I mean, the erasure of lesbians in text or in culture represents the view that heterosexuality is not only the norm, but that heterosexuality is the only option for women. And so indeed, when she refers to heterosexuality, uh, can I have the next slide, Julia, please? Uh, she refers um, to it as a preference that does not need to be explained. On the contrary, she says it is lesbian sexuality, which is seen as requiring an explanation. So very early in the text, Rich puts sexuality in a political context. And specifically, part of the problem with lesbian erasure is about the lack of feminist critique of heterosexuality as a political institution. She said feminists don't do it. And she described how feminist writers who have studied violence against women, women's oppression in the home, for example, have often concluded that heterosexuality might not be so beneficial for women at all. But still, they have argued, or, or they have passed, I mean, they have argued that heterosexuality for women is inevitable, or that heterosexuality is taken for granted. It's just the way it is, is never explained, and it's never questioned. And she and she points that out. So can I have the next slide, please? So the assumption of female heterosexuality seemed to me in itself remarkable. It is an enormous assumption to have glided so silently. So in that text, and I think it's completely brilliant, Adrian Rich reverses the usual question. And the usual question is, what is a lesbian? How can we explain lesbianism? And with Rich, the question becomes, what is a heterosexual woman? Why are women heterosexual? What is even heterosexuality? And she asks why we take it for granted that heterosexuality is natural. So can I have the next slide, please? Um, on the contrary, what she says is, I'm suggesting that heterosexuality like motherhood need to be recognized and studied as a political institution. So as I mentioned earlier, a tenet of feminism is that the person is political and that sexuality is not exempt and there's no reason why it should be exempt from political analysis. That this oppression of women is not something that happens solely, solely you know, in the power such structure such as the government or the workplace. It happens every time we meet men and uh, that oppression uh, happens primarily in our private lives, in our intimate relationship with men. So heterosexual coupling for women is understood by Rich not as a natural sexual preference that should go unquestioned, but instead as a powerful patriarchal institution. In fact, she sees it as the organizing structure of patriarchal power. So can I have the next slide, please? She questioned the assumption that women are naturally and primarily attracted to male, and she suggests that women are the earliest source of emotional caring and physical nurturing, both for female and male children. So what she questioned is whether the search for love and tenderness in both sexes does not originally lead towards women. So she introduced the idea that lesbianism, lesbianism is normal and natural and asked why women would ever think of redirecting that search. So um, next slide, please. To the obvious caveat, but heterosexuality is necessary for survival of the species. Um, she responds, why species survival, the means of impregnation and emotional erotic relations should ever have become so rigidly identified with each other and why such a violent stricture should be found necessary to enforce women's total emotional, erotic, loyal, and subservience. I always have a problem with this one. Sub subservience to men, I think. Um, what she says is a level of heterosexuality is indeed necessary for the human race to survive. But to be fair, we are overpopulating the planet. So maybe the straight could stop for a minute. It's not going to, you, the human race is not going to go extinct straight away, on the contrary. But joke aside, I think there's nothing, what she says, there's nothing in nature that justifies 
that heterosexuality should be organized in the rigid way that we see it is today. So for example, marriage as normal and desirable institution, women's exclusive and lifelong commitment to a male partner, regardless of what they do to us, compulsory motherhood, sex every two days, pornography, female sexual submission as the norm. So the fact that heterosexuality is ritualized in these specific ways, it serves a few political purposes, And one of it, as I said, is to portray heterosexuality as normal, as innate sexual orientation. And we know that um, biological essentialism always serves the oppressor. But of course, heterosexuality, as it is ritualized today, serves the purpose of eroticizing women's subordination, which in turn keep women submissive in private and public life. So can I have the next slide, please? The assumption that women are innately heterosexual stand as a theoretical and political stumbling block for feminism. This is, I think, a really important quote that we're going to go back to later. And it really definitely speaks to me personally because I felt that. Um, if women think of themselves as innately heterosexual, how can we consider heterosexuality to be political? How can we consider it to be oppressive? How can we see it as something we can change in our lives or even escape? And this is where I'm going to end and hand over to Julia. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, so we're going into the second part, talking about actually this system of heterosexuality and the ways in which women are compelled to collaborate within it with men. So when we talk about compulsory heterosexuality, we are talking about a collaboration between men and women. Adrian Rich says that this collaboration perpetuates social relations which are hostile, exploitative, destructive to life itself. It's a system of power over, of men having power over women. But she asks, what are the sources of male power? How can we recognize uh, the characteristics of male power? What Rich does is she takes the work of another woman and expands upon it. So at the bottom of the slide, you see the citation. Um, Rich uses an essay by Kathleen Goh. And Kathleen Goh had talked a little bit about the characteristics of male power, but Goh did not see these characteristics as specifically enforcing heterosexuality. Goh used these characteristics to describe how sexual inequality works. But Rich says, wait a minute, there's a link between these two. Heterosexuality and the enforcement of it is related to sexual inequality. So what I'm going to do now is I'll simply list the eight different characteristics. I'll give some examples that are more relevant to lesbians. Um, but of course, in the essay, Rich offers a lot of other examples. So very quickly, let's go through them one by one. So the characteristics of male power include the power of men to deny women their own sexuality. This is pretty obvious, right? By means of punishment, including death for lesbian sexuality. Also denial of the clitoris, for example, pseudo lesbian images in the media and literature. Number two, to force male sexuality upon women. Um, this includes the idealization of heterosexual romance in art and literature and media and advertising, yada, yada. I mean, we have Valentine's Day coming up. That's another great example. This also includes pornographic depictions of women responding pleasurably to sexual violence. Number three, to command or exploit women's labor to control their produce by institutions of marriage and motherhood being unpaid, also by male control of abortion, contraception, sterilization, and childbirth. Number four, to control or rob women of their children. This includes uh, the court taking custody of the children of lesbian mothers. Also, this includes using the mother as the token torturer in cases of genital mutilation or binding the daughter's feet or her mind in preparation for heterosexual marriage. Number five, to confine women physically and prevent their movement. Duh, obvious. Um, this includes 
rape as terrorism to keep women off the street, also foot binding, high heels, feminine dress codes, the veil. Uh, this also includes enforced economic dependence of wives on their husbands or the next man around. Number six, to use women as objects in male transactions. So when men buy prostitutes for each other, for example, uh, also arranged marriages, bride price, dowry, these kinds of things. Number seven, to cramp women's creativeness. Here come the witch persecutions. This also includes sexual exploitation of women by male artists and teachers. Um, and the general disruption of women's creative aspirations. Finally, last but not least, to withhold from women large areas of the society's knowledge and cultural attainments by simply not educating women. Also, this refers to the great silence regarding the existence of women and particularly lesbians throughout history and culture. So here's the list. Let's move on. Rich says each form of male power that we just talked about adds to a cluster of forces within which women have been convinced that marriage and sexual orientation toward men are inevitable, even if it's unsatisfying or oppressive. When we talk about compulsory heterosexuality, we cannot ignore the concept of romance. Um, Rich says heterosexual romance is one of the reasons why wives stay with abusive husbands. It simplifies the task of the pimp in worldwide prostitution rings. Heterosexual romance is a tool used by men to keep women trapped in a system of female sexual slavery. This idea comes from Kathleen Berry, uh, and she describes this system of female sexual slavery to include situations where women or girls cannot change the conditions of their existence, where they are subject to sexual violence and exploitation by men. It describes all the enforced conditions under which women live subject to men, and this affects women of every race and class. So as an example, girls are trained to find heterosexual romance appealing in the Western world, at least, by teaching them that the most important life, uh, the most important day of their lives is the wedding day. Uh, this is also in fairy tales about the damsel in distress waiting for the knight in shining armor to save her. So all of these efforts that go into socializing women can tell us one thing. We are confronting a pervasive cluster of forces, ranging from physical brutality to control of consciousness. This suggests that an enormous potential counterforce is having to be restrained. I mean, women are really powerful, but look at the messaging we receive. It's beating us down constantly. For example, pornography, it's saturating the mainstream media incredibly so today. Pornography is an influence on the consciousness, and it sends the message that women are natural prey to men, that sexuality and violence are congruent, that for women, sex is masochistic, that women's submission and the cruelty against women in heterosexual sex, the, that these are normal. Pornography also tells us that any sensuality between women is queer or sick or by definition pornographic. Rich says, pornography widens the range of behavior considered acceptable from men in heterosexual intercourse. So all of these messages that we receive that go into socializing women, suppressing women, making us think that we love men, it makes me wonder, if we were not constantly under all of this pressure, how many women would really choose to be with men? Hmm. So, Rich says, the issue that we're facing here is not just gender inequality or um, the male domination of culture or taboos against homosexuality, but really we are confronting the enforcement of heterosexuality for women as a means to assure the male right of physical, economic, and emotional access. Um, this brings me to the topic of consent. In Rich's essay, she also cites Catherine McKinnon, 
who developed um, a lot of great ideas about sexual harassment in the workplace. So I would like to ask, in heterosexuality, does consent really have any meaning? I mean, in heterosexuality, force is normal. Uh, sexual intercourse usually occurs between economic unequals, physical unequals. Rich says the legal requirement that violations of women's sexuality appear out of the ordinary before they are punished helps prevent women from defining the ordinary conditions of consent. Now, I'd like to take a, a pause here to say perhaps we could have a little bit of discussion about this topic. Yeah, I think it's it, the idea of consent in uh, in patriarchy is uh, is very uh, it, it's not often discussed uh, as such. We we always insist on women must say yes, and in fact, I feel like in a world where women are forbidden to say no, um, the the meaning of yes is it's meaningless. Like if you can't say no, then you can't say yes convincingly. That that's I think you know in a short way what 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 is being said. We we unlearn. Uh, our boundaries are, are are broken, but also when we put our boundaries up, we are told that we are rude, that we are impolite, that we are committing violence against men constantly. So I, I don't think consent has any meaning in that context at all. Uh, and the other thing that um, got me thinking is the fact that uh, a lot of women now start to report rape. I mean, we, we talk about unacknowledged rape, so rape that we would um, have happened maybe in a date uh, scenario in a heterosexual setting with a man that we know and that maybe years after you would think wait a minute I never actually consented to that that was violent I remember how I felt and I think that's a really great example of what is consent you know if the first time you had sex with that particular man he actually raped you did mm -hmm. you really consent all these years afterwards um, so yeah just some thought that um, spring to mind with these yeah what does to go on to what you were saying what does yes mean if you're not supposed to say no i'm quoting you actually <laughs> yeah yeah but i um i mean we talked about it yesterday also it's um i mean it's one thing that women are not supposed not supposed to say no from the get-go so the yes is already implied because women are supposed to be submissive and are supposed to like all of this um I struggle a bit with this concept of uh, how can there be consent, not because I think it's wrong, but my mind is, I don't know, doing weird loops. Um, but yesterday I, I thought, well, if we grow up in a culture where violence is normal, and um, I mean, I think we all agree that violent behavior is not something that humans want, women want. Um, but if we grow up in a in a culture that is saturated with violence, then we think that this is normal. So it means that we would consent to something that we perceive as normal. So we consent because we think it's normal. But can we really like, consent to something that is violent if we don't know there would be an alternative? So in that context, what does it mean? if we consent to like normal heterosexual intercourse under whatever condition, if this is just normalized and as expected. Yeah, can this we really so, consent to violence? It's so interesting in the context of BDSM taking over. Uh, you know, we always say BDSM, you know, or pornography, only watch it if you want. Actually, it's everywhere in your face because one of the fetish of BDSM is exhibitionism. So, right, it's everywhere. You go on Twitter, you point everything and you see kink fetish and that's normalizing an extremely violent behavior mm. sexually which is absolutely i think a lot of women who are submissive don't see it as being violent they just see it as being normal because that's what they've always been exposed to i really yeah i really agree with you here anna i'm gonna get back into the slides let me see don't look at my emails thank you <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the next part um, is asking the question about all of these forces. And Adrian Rich says, well, it seems more probable, really, that men fear women could be indifferent to them altogether, that men would only be allowed access to women on women's terms, otherwise be left on the periphery of the matrix. And 
I found this to be kind of funny. It reminded me of um, Valerie Solanas, her scum manifesto, saying that men is just, uh, the male is a walking abortion and they are the ones who are the needy, clingy, um, please love me ones. And women are just switched into that role. Uh, this brings to mind also the topic of male identification, which Rich uh, talks about in her essay. She says, male ownership of women is not just on uh, physical terms, it's also in the mind, on the terms of the perception of the world and the consciousness of women. Patriarchal society portrays the male sex drive, for example, as overpowering, uncontrollable, the penis that has a mind of its own. Um, Adrian Rich says that girls learn from a very young age that the locus of sexual power is male. And so girls start to turn away from their primary female friendships and begin to view those interactions with other girls as a lesser form of relating on every level. So girls begin to adopt a male point of view in order to better be with men, to please men, to anticipate their desires, and to fulfill um, their fantasies. So I want to ask another good question, and maybe we don't need to have a discussion, but this is a question for women watching. If women were really naturally submissive, if women naturally were heterosexual, if they were born that way, then why is all of this force necessary? So I would like to come back to the one of the topics that Angela mentioned, the stumbling block for feminism. The assumption that women are innately heterosexual is a stumbling block for feminism. For women, heterosexuality might not be a preference at all, but it's something that is imposed, propagandized, and maintained by force. Rich says this male identification, it's the internalization of the values of the colonizer. It's actively participating in carrying out the colonization of yourself and your entire sex class. She reminds us though, Rich says, no matter how woman identified or woman centered we are as lesbians or as feminists, we are still indoctrinated into male identification. So none of us are really uh, above this, but we can try to resist it. And I would like to make the point that talking about sexuality is crucial for feminist theory. We can't have lesbianism conveniently forgotten or sidelined. Oh, you wanna talk about lesbianism? Okay, you do that over there. No, we, we have to include it into our political analysis. Women have to have the chance to think about this, if not um, an option for them, at least then an example of female resistance. So I'd like to go on to Anna. Yeah, um, I also want to stress the part about the stumbling block again, um, because it's obvious that feminism needs to expand in a way that allows us uh, to perceive women's behavior also as a form of resistance. So we need to have a feminism that allows us to see women's behavior as a sign of women actually seeking liberation and not actually seeking submission. Um, so the second part that Julia just did uh, basically looked at men's behavior or how men enforce compulsory heterosexuality. The third part in the essay um, is called on lesbian existence and lesbian continuum. And so it basically looks at women's behaviors it looks at how women find ways to escape compulsory heterosexuality against all odds. Next slide, please. Heterosexuality has been both forcibly and subliminally imposed on women. Yet everywhere women have resisted it, often at the cost of physical torture, imprisonment, psychosurgery, social or stress, also, <laughs> that's my word, ostracism and extreme poverty. So I want to repeat, women's sexual and emotional coupling with men, heterosexuality, has to be imposed because it's not a given and it's not innate. So we have to expect women's resistance to it. 
So in this quote, we start to see Rich's take on lesbianism, namely as something that is politically significant. She puts lesbians across centuries in the context of liberation and resistance. She sees it as a feminism in action that has re-emerged in every culture in every period. So she broadens the understanding of lesbianism to allow us to see the political element. Next slide, please. Lesbian existence comprises both the breaking of a taboo and the rejection of a compulsory way of life. I mean the term lesbian continuum to include a range through each woman's life and throughout history of woman identified experience. So Rich doesn't want to use the term uh, lesbianism because for her it has a clinical and limiting meaning. So instead she introduces a new framework of understanding the lesbian existence on one side and the lesbian continuum. Lesbian existence for her as a word signifies the historical presence of lesbians and the ongoing creation of this existence. So basically she uses the word lesbian existence to counterbalance patriarchy's enforced historical amnesia when it comes to this. Obviously it's breaking, it's the breaking of a taboo, it's the rejection of a compulsory way of life, but it's also a direct and indirect attack on the male right of access to women. But she says it's also more than just naysaying to patriarchy. She says lesbian existence is a profoundly female experience. Uh, the lesbian continuum on the other side, um, she later wrote an article called Reflections on Compulsory Heterosexuality. She published it in 2004 and said that she put the framework of le the lesbian continuum rather clumsily. Um, so I'm trying to say what I think she meant. <laughs> So with the lesbian continuum, with the concept of the lesbian continuum, she's trying to bridge the gap between lesbian and heterosexual feminists. Uh, in my opinion, she could also have called it the woman identified continuum um, because it is about woman identified experiences. Uh, it's important for her to say that it's not just uh, the lesbian continuum or lesbian existence is not just genital sexual experiences, but much more. For her, it includes many forms of primary intensity between women, the sharing of, rich in, of a rich inner life, the bonding against male tyranny, the giving and receiving of support. So this concept, the way she broadens this, helps us to put the context of women's lives, so the contextual forces that come from compulsory heterosexuality, into the equation. Next slide, please. The fact is that women in every culture and throughout history have undertaken the task of independent, non-heterosexual woman-connected existence to the extent made possible by their context, often in the belief that they were the only ones ever to have done so. So the extent to which women can resist the institution of compulsory heterosexuality, the extent to which women can live a woman-centered life depends heavily on the punishment and forces of a given time and place. But through this lens, we can see some forms of resistance throughout women's history. So in this lesbian continuum that she's trying to uh, conceptualize, um, we see that we see women resisting or women's resistance emerging in different ways. Um, so she says, for example, we can see it across time from the intimate girlfriendships we might have had now, back to the beguines uh, in Europe from the 13th to 16th century, but then even further back to the lesbians around Sappho in the seventh century BC. But then also you could see it span across the globe from the secret networks uh, she found or she quotes among African women all the way to the Chinese marriage resistors. So the behavior we see is always what is possible in this time, in this place, 
even though there are so many forces to keep us coupling up with men. So for her, all women that resist compulsory heterosexuality fall on this continuum. Next slide, please. If we consider the possibility that all women exist on a lesbian continuum, we can see ourselves as moving in and out of this continuum, whether we identify ourselves as lesbian or not. And I don't know if we have the time, Julia, are you checking the time? If we have the time, I would like to open this for discussion because when I read the text initially, it was a bit hard for me to grasp. I felt a lot of resistance because initially I thought, oh, she's trivializing lesbian experiences here. Um, now working through the text, I can see that she doesn't, that she basically says, well, you have those forces. So a woman resisting to marry Maybe that's all she can do at this time. We don't know if in a, if in a different society, in a different world, uh, she would actually be with a woman. Mm. We do have a few moments if, if we would like to say something else. Yeah. Angela? Yes, um, I think, yes, this quote, you're right, is often uh, uh, the reason of a lot of anger in, a, in some circles. Um, I think very often it is because it is taken out of context. And I think because if we don't, if we read only this quote without the understanding of what the lesbian continuum is, then it, 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 it seems to be trivializing or de even desexualizing lesbianism. And I think it's not the case because this is not about lesbian experience. It's about that woman identified experience that opting out of heterosexuality that you mentioned. So I think actually it's uh, it's really spot on and really helpful the way you broke this down. Um, what I find really interesting is that the idea of the lesbian continuum is a useful tool that Rich figured out that as I think that's what enabled us uh, her to figure out, uh, you know, to put Emily Dickinson on the lesbian map, for example, um, like spotting in a woman's life some elements that are not traditionally heterosexual, some things that, you know, only maybe a lesbian who would see this through this lens would be able to spot. And in that aspect, the, the idea, the concept of lesbian continuum is really, in my opinion, is really important, but misunderstood. Yeah, I agree with the points that both of you are making. I also think um, this is, I, I see the idea of a lesbian continuum as an invitation for women to reflect on their own experiences, to think about the relationships that they themselves have shared with their female friends and the women around them. And does this experience fall on the continuum? I would agree with Anna. It could also be referred to as the woman identified continuum uh, because I, I had a feeling, a resistance to seeing this word lesbian used in this context. I also felt a little bit angry, but. I also keep in mind, this is a theory. This is Adrian Rich's ideas about this very complicated concept. Um, so let's just build on it. Okay, so um, whatever we say, whatever we think she thinks, it's very important that the erotic element must not be excluded from lesbian existence. And also the good thing is that she doesn't. Next slide, please. We begin to observe behavior both in history and in individual biography that has hitherto been invisible or misnamed, behavior which often constitutes, given the limits of the counterforce exerted in a given time and place, radical rebellion. And we connect these rebellions and the necessity for them with the physical passion of women for women, which is central to lesbian existence the erotic sensuality, which has been precisely the most violently erased fact of female experience. So even though she's broadening the idea of lesbian existence by adding the lesbian continuum, which again is thought to bridge the gap between heterosexual and lesbian women, it is important to note that the erotic acts as a central part for her. And as other lesbian feminists did, for example, Audre Lorde, she also broadens the term of the erotic beyond simply meaning sex or sexuality, but rather to include intimacy and sensuality. 
She says, but as we deepen and broaden the range of what we define as lesbian existence, as we delineate a lesbian continuum, we begin to discover the erotic in female terms as that which is unconfined to any single part of the body or solely to the body itself, as an energy not only diffuse, but as Audre Lorde has described it, omnipresent in the sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, and in the sharing of work, as the empowering joy, which makes us willing, less willing to accept powerlessness. So, the element of erotic sensuality between women, so its intensity, its intimacy, and its many layers, obviously has been forced by men into lesbian sex as something shallow and pornographic, something performed, uh, where something where male fantasies are performed to be consumed by men. But nothing could be farther from the truth. And actually, if you like to read more on this, I recommend reading Marilyn, Marilyn Fry's On Lesbian Sex. Um, so for me, coming to feminism as a lesbian, um, it made me notice how I actually share intimate female connections with other, other women that are very intense, but not necessarily sexual. Um, is this something that the two of you would like to say something about, if we have the time? I would like to say really quickly that I concur because of my indoctrination into male identification. I did not use the word lesbian in reference to myself because I understood it to refer to pornography. Um, also the word erotic. I had a difficulty with this word, understanding what rich meant, because I understand this word to be part of the advertisement on porn shops, like stores that sell pornography so the words that we have are um, limited and sometimes they are corrupted by men's desires and I think it's important to also consider intimacy this is a better a more relevant word for me personally to understand the connections that women can share along the lesbian continuum it's intimate yeah I have two points uh, conquering on the on the on the term um, what she says about sex and the way that you mentioned uh, Marin Fry. I mean, um, you know, considering what men do to women sexually and what women do together and using the same word to describe both is just wrong. Because, I mean, I, I've, I've struggled with this for a very long time, having had, unfortunately, the experience with men as well. Uh, it's like comparing two things that are not comparable, not in the same universe, that there's nothing in common with these two things, and there's no reason that we should use the same word for them. It's, it's not right. Um, I also really love that she defines the lesbian erotic as not unconfined to any single part of the body or even to the body itself. And uh, I think it's quite an accurate depiction of the energy between lesbians, especially in the lesbian feminist movement. And I, in my experience, it's the only place we have um, uh, simultaneously friends, colleagues, lovers, uh, and all the intensity and the multi-layeredness of, of all these relationships in one place which I think is quite unique uh, to our movement uh, and to my knowledge, not to be found anywhere else. And the erotic is not something that is out of it. Very often we are told, oh, political lesbians, the, the fact that um, we talk about um, building a culture as if we were not talking about eroticism or, se or sexuality or intimacy. Uh, this is on top of everything. It's, it's just a much richer way to live it, I think. Yeah, so um, when she's broadening the understanding of lesbianism beyond the sexual, it also brings her to a different understanding of lesbianism. I'm sorry, I'm using the word lesbianism. She says lesbian existence, I'm sorry, versus male homosexuality. Next slide. Lesbians have historically been deprived of a political existence through inclusion as female versions of male homosexuality. To equate lesbian existence with male homosexuality because each is stigmatized is to erase female reality once again. And she continues, 
I perceive the lesbian experience as being like motherhood, a profoundly female experience with particular oppressions, meanings, and pot potentialities we cannot comprehend as long as we simply bracket is, it with other sexually stigmatized existences. Just as the term parenting serves to conceal the particular and significant reality of being a parent who is actually a mother, the term gay may serve the purpose of blurring the very outlines we need to discern, which are of crucial value for feminism and for the freedom of women as a group. So for Rich, it's really important, she stresses that throughout the text, that lesbian existence is not simply the gay in female terms, but that we need to understand the bigger societal picture. Where are women situated? What are women's resources? How is lesbian life and lesbian experience different of gay men? How is this obstructed or mm, making really bl like blurry if we only say gay men and gay women? And Angela and Andrea, I know you have ideas about the slides that you want to share briefly. I do, and seeing all the likes and hearts that come of the chat reaction, I think a lot of women will have spotted the how contemporary this is, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's difficult to unsee the like unbelievable, like lesbian instead of queer women, mothers uh, becomes birthing parents in today LGBT uh, context and queer context. This is exactly what's happening. So I am not sure what was Rich's um, view on transgenderism. I, I don't know her work well enough to know if she has written about this, but it strikes me as, um, I mean, given all the conceptual tools that we're dealing with now, uh, it's, it's obvious that lesbian feminists were the first one to spot transgenderism as a, a threat to women. Uh, it is indeed, you know, it's, it's lesbian feminists who were the first to do that um, because all the tools are there and it's, it's just uh, incredible. And the other thing I wanted to say is obviously uh, today, any new gender critical group that would insist on joining, false joining lesbian with other letters is bound to repeat the same failures. It will happen again because you know, we are not the, the B or the G or whatever else. We are lesbians and, and we need to be separate. I think when we talk about what did Adrian Rich um, think about this specific topic, Anna and I were talking about this and she said, you, you said um, uh, Adrian Rich actually helped Janice Raymond write The Transsexual Empire or there's, there's some kind of credit to Adrian Rich. Anna, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so we can assume that she had the tools. Let's, let's assume. Say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it is a bit infuriating. We've been dealing with this kind of stuff for so long. And <laughs> let's just get done with it. Yeah. I mean, for me in this uh, in this part, it was obvious how, um, how the word queer actually helps to like make this difference like disappear. And so because it makes lesbians invisible or as just like the same in a group without the specific needs and struggles that women face when they are lesbians. So I want to continue. Um, so if we believe that heterosexuality is normal for women, then the lives of the begins in Europe or of the Chinese marriage resistors are seen as abnorm abnormal and unnatural. So the work of these women and also other women, their work of self-creation is undervalued and they're being understood as having penis envy or as being men haters. Next slide, please. But when we turn the lens of vision and consider the degree to which and the methods whereby heterosexual preference has actually been imposed on women, not only can we understand differently the meaning of the individual lives and work, but we can begin to recognize a central fact of women's history that women have always resisted male tyranny. So it has become clear, at least for me also in preparing this text, if we as feminists have no understanding of compulsory heterosexuality, so of the sexual and emotional coupling of women with men that is enforced. If we have no understanding of this as a bigger system, as an institution, as something that is implemented with force 
or as an ideology that demands heterosexual coupling also by means of psychological manipulation, like the romance stories, romance no novels, movies, Valentine's Day, happy Valentine's Day. Then we cannot fully perceive and understand women's ways of resisting it. We cannot perceive how alien the coupling with men might be for women. We cannot comprehend the loss of our sexual and emotional energies being taken away from ourselves, from other women, from women identified values. Only if we broaden our vision of heterosexuality as an institution, we can begin to see the strength and the resistance of women shining through. We can begin to see how women are connected through this in so many different ways, through times and different places. We can begin to see lesbian existence as a refocusing of our stolen energy back to ourselves as something deeply political, as if we are aware of it or not, as actual feminism in action. Next slide. I want to end my part with this brilliant and encouraging quote uh, that very much resonates with me and with my own experience as a lesbian coming to feminism. And also because I really wanted this quote in there. <laughs> Woman identification is a source of energy, a potential springhead of female power curtailed and contained under the institution of heterosexuality. Angela, take off. Look at all the hearts. Look at all the reactions. Oh, this is a, <laughs> yes, it's an amazing quote. Um, so I'm going to go through the conclusion now. Uh, and um, in the conclusion, in the last part of the text, Rich discusses the different ways patriarchy lies to women about the nature of heterosexuality. So can I have the next slide? She calls the lie of uh, she calls it the lie of compulsory female heterosexuality, and it goes like this. So the lie that women are inevitably drawn to men, even when this attraction is suicidal, meaning even when it means death for the woman. And we know that death in heterosexuality happens to women at an alarming rate, as most women are killed or raped by a man they know or are intimate with. And that means that heterosexuality is a pretty deadly institution for women. Number two, the lie that women need men as social and economic protectors for adult sexuality and for, for psychological completion. I love this one. Hence the rise again of the traditional housewife, the myth that women need men to be complete and happy and uh, sexually fulfilled as if this was possible uh, for men to do that. Number three, the lie that heterosexually constituted family is the basic social unit. And this is promoted alongside the idea that a single mother or a lesbian mother, a mother without a man, is deviant, 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 abusive um, by definition. I know it sounds very 80s, but this one is making a big comeback lately. Um, number th four, the lie that women who do not attach their primary intensity to men must be condemned to outsiderhood. Because in a male-centered world, men need to present themselves as the center of everything. So not centering men must mean being alone and ostracized. Many heterosexual women are profoundly, profoundly lonely in their heterosexual couples, by the way. Uh, number five, women turn to women out of hatred of men or to escape male abuse. And this, I think, is um, rather than an electric and empowering charge between women. And this is a patriarchal way to dis describe lesbianism as being consistently represented as negative rather than anything positive, anything that comes from a desire rather than an escape. So can I have please the next slide? The consequence of this lie are very destructive for women on personal level, of course. So the lie of compulsory female heterosexuality keeps numberless women psychologically trapped, trying to fit mind, spirit, and sexuality in a prescribed script, the script of heterosexuality, because they cannot look beyond the parameter of the acceptable. For the lesbian trapped in the closet, the woman imprisoned, in prescriptive ideas of the normal, share the pain of blocked options 
broken connection, lost access of self-definition freely and powerfully assumed. I think here what's so interesting in these two quotes is that she describes how compulsory heterosexuality is devastating both for women in heterosexuality and for lesbians who know they are in the closet. Um, and I want to ask, where is the line between a woman in prison in a prescript, prescript, prescriptive ID of the normal and a lesbian trapped in the closet? And indeed, what is the closet and how far does it go if women don't have the consciousness of being in the closet? Uh, and how many women are in this situation? So in slide, next slide, please. The question inevitably arises: are we then to condemn all heterosexual relationships, including those which are least oppressive? I believe this question, though often heartfelt, is the wrong question here. And it may be that this question is happening in the chat. I haven't checked. But what she replies with this is within the institution exist, of course, qualitative difference of experience. But the absence of choice remains the great unacknowledged reality. And in the absence of choice, women will remain dependent upon the chance or luck of particular relationship and will have no collective power to determine the meaning and place of sexuality in their lives. And so in other words, women can choose their oppressor, but we cannot choose to opt out of this oppression because it is forbidden for us to do so. Women may get lucky and get a good one, uh, but that's up to him, and also it may change. Uh, however, the institution of heterosexuality ensures most women end up married with children, and that means that women remain collectively politically unable to self-determination. And can I have the next slide, which will be the last? Um, there is a feminist political context, content in the act of choosing a woman's lover, a life partner, in the face of institutionalized heterosexuality. But for lesbian existence to realize this potential political content, blah, but for lesbian existence to realize this political content in an ultimately liberating form, the erotic, erotic choice must deepen and expand into conscious woman identification into lesbian feminism. Not the choice of word, choosing a woman partner. So going back to her rich own framework, if heterosexuality is not innate but enforced, if women's natural inclination is towards women, then it makes sense that women can choose to live heterosexuality and that women can choose to be lesbians. Here again, Rich connects the experience of women in heterosexuality with the experience of lesbians by saying both would benefit from reaching a feminist consciousness, from politicizing their personal experience by becoming women identified. The personal is political, given the context of our lives and the huge pressure to conform to heterosexuality, being a, lesbian, being a lesbian is not only a personal act, it's of course a political one because everything is political when you are a woman. And so I think we have a couple of minutes um, to discuss um, this and maybe other things. So I'm going to just leave it open. For you we too. have about two minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I really love the way that we ended this. I think it's important to bring back the idea that women can make a conscious choice to step away from one world and imagine another and build upon the relationships and uh, connections that they share with other women. Um, one of the topics in the text that I would like to bring a question to is the idea of lesbians who are not feminists. I came out as a lesbian with the help of feminist theory. I was really programmed by religion, for one thing. And reading, for example, Valerie Solanas, it helped me realize that there is another way to live. And I was, I had been like put off of that course at a very early age. Um, so then I thought, okay, all lesbians are feminists. It made sense. They're women identified, right? But not all lesbians are feminists. And that was a little bit confusing for me. <laughs> it comes to the point of conscious woman identification. Yeah, I also want to stress this, um, like as a lesbian uh, coming to feminism and not the other way around. Um, so no, not all lesbians are feminists. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, 
So I think this, this topic is really important also for lesbians because it can help us find strength, like in framing this as a, as a form of resistance, as something that is not, uh, not abnormal or weak, or weak or whatever, but, or sick, but actually as a, as a sign of maybe even health to try to get out of it. Um, and it can really help to become more woman identified. Like as a lesbian, I wasn't necessarily woman identified but feminism and like woman centeredness really helped me to get there. So it helps to connect with women also on a lot, on, a, on many different levels. And I think that's why it's really helpful, not just for heterosexual women, but also lesbians. And I think what we also really need to do is look at how heterosexuality is imposed right now in our time and age and place. We can do this in consciousness raising groups, for example. <laughs> right. I'm going to, to close back with uh, my own remarks on this, uh, to look back um, at the beginning of the text in 1980, when Rich wrote this essay, her point was that lesbians and compulsory heterosexuality were not discussed in mainstream feminism. Today, in 2023, um, when we have a rich, in-depth, I mean, you can see the richness of, of discussion that we've had today um, about lesbian feminism and compulsory heterosexuality, I find we somehow found ourselves in a similar situation where this is very difficult to discuss uh, in most places. Um, and um, I do understand that um, it's it's a difficult topic for women. It's a difficult topic for women in heterosexuality. Uh, it brings a lot of strong emotions. You have to confront yourself to your life and it's not easily done. I know I've been through it, uh, coming from heterosexuality into escaping heterosexuality. What I want to say for, on a personal and political level, obviously, uh, is that it's challenging, but it's really worth it. And I really recommend that women go into this text, uh, find other women to discuss them and question these, uh, these aspects of our lives. You will not regret it. That's it. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye now.